Hi LaGuardia friends, welcome to Ecology Lesson 3. In this lesson, you will learn how to explain the difference between abiotic and biotic factors and explain how abiotic and biotic factors influence an ecosystem. Make sure you're taking notes. Let's get started. So this is our third lesson in ecology. Ecology is the study of how organisms interact with other organisms and their physical environment. Look at this beautiful picture of the temperate rainforest in Washington state. Can you identify organisms and non-living things that would be living in this rainforest? An ecosystem are all the organisms or living things and non-living things in an area that interact. So here you can see that we have various animals, we have plants, water, air, all of these items make up part of this ecosystem. Ecosystems have a balance between abiotic and biotic factors. So abiotic factors are the non-living factors. So those include things like sunlight, temperature, precipitation, water, soil, pH, while biotic factors involve living things, which can involve producers, consumers, herbivores, carnivores, decomposers, etc. So an ecosystem is composed of these two factors together. In all ecosystems, there is an interaction between the abiotic factors and the biotic factors, as all organisms need directly or indirectly sunlight, water, and oxygen. And all organisms produce carbon dioxide and food for other organisms. In this picture, you can see a biological relationship between producers or autotrophs that produce their own food using photosynthesis and consumers, also called heterotrophs, which consume producers in order to obtain glucose. Both organisms use glucose to make energy. All organisms use glucose to make energy using the mitochondria in their cells, but only plants are able to take the abiotic factors of sunlight and carbon dioxide and turn it into glucose. So in this diagram, you can notice we have some abiotic factors like water, sunlight, carbon dioxide, and oxygen, and some biotic factors like a rabbit, in a plant. Every ecosystem involves the interaction between both abiotic or non-living factors and biotic living factors. Here you can see lots of examples of different specific ecosystems. Specific ecosystems can be broken out into categories called biomes. So biomes have very similar abiotic factors. So similar amounts of precipitation and temperature variability and direct sunlight. And those abiotic factors influence the biotic factors or the living organisms that are able to be supported within the ecosystem. So for instance, we know in a tropical rainforest, there's a lot of precipitation and a higher temperature. So we will find different organisms in a tropical rainforest biome as compared to a temperate forest biome or a desert biome. So when you vary the abiotic factors, you're going to also have different biotic factors. Different abiotic factors can be found in different specific ecosystems, also called biomes. So in a desert biome, 
you'll find much hotter temperatures and much less rainfall than in a temperate forest biome, varying temperatures and varying amounts of precipitation based on the season. The abiotic factors always influence the amount and type of life that can be supported in each biome. So you will not find the same organisms in the desert as you will in the tropical rainforest. The organisms within each ecosystem will have different biotic components interacting with one another. Competition is an example how limited resources can affect the overall population or number of different species. Let's watch a video to see how this can play out. But sometimes a healthy ecosystem gets damaged when too many of a certain species eat all the food. Just imagine a swarm of locusts eating all the vegetation in sight. Once the ecosystem gets that damaged, it can impact the health of everything that lives there. So what's the right balance? There is a definite balance and different types of biological relationships that help support a healthy carrying capacity. Let's see what the amoeba sisters have to say. I really did not like sandboxes as a kid. It's not that I have a problem with sand or sand on the beach or sand castles, just sand boxes. See, as a little kid, I'd play with something, then I'd kind of forget about it and then rediscover it and it'd be all new again. This is what happened with my sandbox. Except when I rediscovered it, the sand had all these tiny holes in it. My dad was with me and exclaimed, well, look at that, your sandbox is full of antlions. Perhaps my dad should not have assumed that I knew what antlions were. I eventually figured out what they were later on. And it makes sense now because my father really loves insects. Antlions are insects. In their adult form, they sort of look, in my personal opinion, like a less cool version of a dragonfly. They are not a dragonfly. But in their larva stage, they look, well, not like many things I can compare it to. They have these mandibles and they make these sand pit traps. And then they wait with their mandibles just showing above the surface. When an ant or other small insect walks over their sand pit, they drag it in. They pull the ant underground, biting it and injecting it with enzymes to digest it in order to consume the ant's juices. I also have learned by watching them that they toss sand at their ant victim too if they need help subduing it before they drag them under. Those ant lions are mean. They throw sand in your face. Man. Thankfully, antlions are small. In fact, doodlebug is evidently another name for these things. I'm not exactly sure how you go from antlion to doodlebug, but okay. It's all relative. They're bad news for an ant. Because the antlion is a predator of the ant. The ant is their prey. That's an ecological relationship right there. And that's what we're going to talk about. Ecological relationships. Typically, if we were to graph the predator and prey populations in our example, when the population of ants in this confined area increase, it is likely that the antlions, which are the predators, also will increase over time because they have more food to eat. However, if the antlions increase too much, there won't be enough ants, which are the prey, to feed on. So the antlions will decrease. You can see that relationship in this predator and prey graph. In most ecosystems, predator and prey graphs go up and down frequently. It cycles. Also, just because this antlion is a predator doesn't mean that this is the only role it plays. An antlion can get eaten by a bird. Now the antlion has just become the bird's prey. Competition is also another relationship to consider. Antlions are consumers, which means they have to eat other things. They can't make their own food. They have to compete with other antlions for this food too. This food being their prey, the ants. This example shows competition for a limiting biotic factor. And they're not just competing with other antlions for this biotic factor. They may have to compete with completely different species in the area that are also predators of ants too. For example, jumping spiders like ants. You know, it's not just consumers that compete. 
Producers, like this plant, make their own food, but that does not mean they don't have to deal with competition. For example, this plant here is competing for this limiting abiotic factor, light. Symbiotic relationships are specific types of relationships where different species live together. We will discuss symbiotic relationships where biotic interactions occur in another lesson. So why do all these relationships matter anyway? Well, one reason is that these interactions can make significant impacts on populations of different species living together. That means if the population of a certain species is threatened by human activity, for example, it can affect more than just that one species. Scientists continue to learn about new ecological relationships all the time. So this concludes lesson number three on ecology. The big ideas are that ecosystems depend on both abiotic, non-living, and biotic, living factors. Abiotic and biotic factors can be limiting factors that influence the carrying capacity of organisms in an environment. Competition for these resources will help us determine what the carrying capacity is for the environment. Make sure you've taken good notes, complete your homework on Google Classroom, and we'll see you soon.